And I go around the corner to the Kroger and I buy everything that I could buy with that $5 and I turn it into 60 that night because like she said she would, she paid me. And so then I took the five back that I started with and I put that back just in case everything goes wrong. And I turned that into 600 by the end of the week. And I've been flipping that same money for 17 years. Coming up next, Mignon Francois is just an amazing woman. Not only does she have one of the premier cupcake companies in the nation with locations in both Nashville and in New Orleans, the Cupcake Collection, she was down to her last $5. I'm not going to spill that story. We're going to have her tell her amazing story. And here she comes down to the basement. Mignon Francois is here. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to tell your story to our Stacker community. It, it, things have not always been this good for you. I want to <laughs> open up this conversation kind of where you open up your new book, Mignon, which is there's a knock on your door and it's your neighbor and she's got like this great offer, but you're not happy about this great offer. Can you <laughs> can, can you share this story with everybody? Yes. My neighbor comes over. I'm sitting in my house doing the Dave Ramsey baby set plan in the back of my house with no electricity because we can't afford it. And we're running our house on a generator. And so I sit in the house in the dark. Um, or go away from the house all day to save up the gas in the generator so that when the children come home, they can have normalcy. I'm also at this time in my life filling the the bathtub with water so that my children can take baths. So oftentimes we're warming water over a fire in a pot and pouring that little bits at a time into the tub. And so I have no electricity, I have no running water, and I'm doing the Dave Ramsey baby step plan when I realize all I have is $5 and I haven't even fed the family for the week. When my neighbor knocks on the door and says, hey, I have a great idea. You should make cupcakes for all of my clients for the season and I will buy them from you. That problem sounds great. Is, the problem is she doesn't know that. <laughs> I'm sitting in my house with no electricity and I only have $5. <laughs> so, so she sees the perplexity in my face and says, listen, I can't pass them all out at one time. So as you make them, I'll pay you. And, you know, sometimes the people mean that they'll pay you in 30 days or they'll pay you when they get an invoice or they'll pay you by Friday, and if I was going to take this deal, she was going to need to pay me when I gave her product, which was going to be today. Like, I, I need to get paid today. And so um, I decide to say, okay, so what you're saying is you're going to pay me today. And she said, yes. And so I was like, okay, I'll take it. And I shut the door, and I begin to have a come to Jesus moment with God. Like, God. Why would you give me this opportunity when I only have five dollars? And God said, but I feed birds and they don't toil or store up in barns. So how much more will I do for you who looks like me? And I say, OK. And I test him to see if he's real. And I go around the corner to the Kroger and I buy everything that I could buy with that five dollars. And I turn it into 60 that night because like she said, she would. She paid me. And so then I took the five back that I started with and I put that back just in case everything goes wrong. And I turned that into 600 by the end of the week. And I've been flipping that same money for 17 years to the tune of no debt. No, um, I own the house now where the cupcake collection lives. It was the same house that we were losing to foreclosure on the day that we opened the store. And I did it with no knowledge of the business. And what a lot of people don't know is that I didn't know how to bake, not even out of a box. <laughs> when she offered me this opportunity, it was because I had decided that I wanted to be 
out, right? And so when you when you decide that you want to get out of the situation that you're in, you got to figure out what does out look like for you. Well, out for me meant that I would be able to have electricity on a regular basis. And I had been going around the neighborhood because Dave Ramsey was saying you could get out of debt by having a bake sale or a garage sale. And my thought was, well, I guess all we can do is have a bake sale because we don't have anything we can sell because we sold everything we had just to get here to Nashville. Which, as I'm sitting here talking to you about it, I was a gambler with my life. <laughs> you, tru- you truly were. And I'm thinking, and I'm, and, and I'm wondering, you're following the Dave Ramsey plan. Mm-hmm. You, you talk in your book about how you, you, you're using the envelope system. And of course, there's, old, there's five bucks put in an envelope at that time. Mm-hmm. How did you get to that point, though? How did you get to the point where there was just five bucks there? Yeah, so I was a stay at home mom. And so, you know, as a stay at home mom, your job is to manage the resources of the finances of the family. Well, I had a husband who didn't feel like his priority was to bring me all of the money first and then let me part it out from there. So what he would do was give me whatever was left after he was done using it. So what I would have to do would then to be start stuffing cash and hiding money and collecting it over time to sort of build up enough in order to pay off anything. You, you said your kids uh, said red beans and rice again. Again, <laughs> like you, you could hear them groan as you were making it. Yes. We're from New Orleans, so red beans and rice is a very inexpensive meal, and ours wasn't even going to have meat in it. It was just going to be vegetarian red beans and rice. Well, it made me laugh as I because I have a personal connection to red beans and rice. My father-in-law, who was my best friend when he was alive, just a wonderful man, and oh. uh, he, but he was a health addict, and and he thought that red beans and rice was the cure for everything. So when my twins were like four. I would have to take him out to dinner after they went to Papa Dave's because he'd try to get him to eat red beans and rice every day. So my kids at least had the opportunity. Yours didn't. Yours had to suck down the red beans and rice. That's all they could do. Yeah, well, we're from New Orleans. So red beans and rice is not like a consolation prize or anything like that. It's kind of like, okay, but just not every day, mom. Right. Right. It reminds me of the time growing up we got, I don't know what happened. There was a salesman that came through and we had hot dogs and uh, they, 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 they mistakenly bought too many hot dogs. So every day we had macaroni and cheese and hot dogs, or we had rice and hot dogs and we had, there was hot dogs in everything we had, but, but, and I'm making that is so funny that you said hot dogs though, because I was going to say the other thing we did have that I don't think I mentioned in the book is hot dogs. And that was because that my, like to this day, like my children mostly will not eat hot dogs <laughs> because my son always tells this story of how we had a whole box of hot dogs that we got for free from like some rep or something like that at one point. And all we had to eat was hot dogs. So it was just like either hot dogs or red beans and rice. And he was like, I never want to see a hot dog again. And my daughters will not eat hot dogs. <laughs> And, and, and by the way, for everybody listening, obviously this is a difficult time in your life and I'm not, and I'm not making fun or making light yeah. of it, but it certainly is great that we can sit and laugh about it now. Right. Yeah, because definitely. like, like everything, and for people listening, you will get through this. If you're in a yeah. si- similar situation, I mean, we're here to prove that you will get through this and someday you'll be laughing about it too. Um, yeah. You, you before, before this, uh, a cupcake collection. And I just, I go to your website and I start like Pavlov's dog starts salivating. I just, <laughs> I just want to, if I was your next door neighbor, I think I'd weigh 700 pounds. Cause I'd be consuming all of your, I couldn't work. Guess for your- what? You wouldn't gain any weight. Actually, you'd be like me and you'd lose 50 pounds eating them every day. You know why? Well, because I, we put a lot of love in our product and we believe uh, that if love conquers all, it has got to include calories. <laughs> that's 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 fabulous. Well, then I would want to go. Yeah, let's go. I'm, I'm going to send you my resume as soon as we're done. But, but, but you said this wasn't the first the first business you'd started. You tried to start businesses before this yep. one. What made the cupcake collection stick where the other businesses had not? Because I was a sick and tired of being sick and tired. B, I was afraid of God. 
And I'll explain that part to you. But three, it <laughs> A, B, and three. <laughs> it was just that I had always started. It was finishing that I had a problem with. I would always start businesses. And I, I think I would find fun in starting. But there was, you know, as soon as I would hit a rock, you know, or a hard place or hit a, a place where I had to go out and sell myself or, you know, be outgoing, I would quit. And so my problem was, is that I was a quitter. And the first thing I had to learn was to quit quitting. And the reason I was afraid of God was because I was being awakened every night at 317 exactly by really? a clock. Really? Mm -hmm. And it, there was no alarm clock, but when I'd wake up, my eyes would pop open. It was 317. And I thought it was to go check the stove and the oven. And I go into this into detail in the book. So I have to go to the book to read it. But I found out that that's not what it was about, that God was trying to speak to me. And this was the only time I would be silent. So the first day that I came to say, OK, God, well, how do you hear your voice? And please don't talk, though, because if I actually heard it, I might just pass out and not live or die <laughs> right now. And, you know, so I decided to open up the Bible and go to chapter three and verse 17. And in that that day, I got my first set of instructions. And so I was being awakened like this every night and I would show up into my living room and sit on the sofa and open my Bible and just go through the whole Bible, starting at chapter three in any book and ride through until the sun would come up. And when God got ready to stop awakening me in those wee hours of the morning, one of the last verses I read was uh, between Deuteronomy 30, chapter 19 and Joshua, I believe it was one and nine. And it said, I'm setting before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that your family can live. And if you do not turn to the left or to the right from anything that I've shared with you today, you will be prosperous and successful in everything that you do. And so the reason why I say I was afraid of God is because I had I had had God ideas before, not just good ideas. I had had God ideas before. And because I believed these were my ideas, you know, because we're, we're, we're so arrogant to believe that anything we come up with is ours anyway. At least that's my thought. And, and, and God was saying to me, it was my idea in the first place, and I'm the one that gave it to you. So when you think that you're responsible for the success of it, you're not. I just need you to be consistent and show up to it every day. And so when I when God was awakening me and then he says, OK, now here it is. You've gotten everything. I had been writing feverishly in a journal every night until the sun would come up. Anything that would pop into my head, because I learned scientifically ideas go away if you don't write them down. Have you ever had one of those ideas, Joe, that just like, oh, oh I get home, I'm going to write that down. I, I or, or yes. Or I wake up in the middle of the night and I think, oh, that's fabulous. But I'll write it down tomorrow morning. Uh -huh. And the next morning, I'm like, that idea was so good and it's gone. It's You're just like, completely what was gone. That? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I learned to write all the ideas down. And when he stopped waking me up, I have filled an entire journal book. And it was all the instructions that I was going to need to open up the cupcake collection and make it successful. You know, it's funny for entrepreneurs and people um, and, and people who are artists. Well, heck, people even in their everyday job. If we if we suffer from procrastination, I've been I've been reading Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art, which I don't know, Mignon, if you've read this book, but he talks about in the middle chapters about how there's something spiritual going on and about how he said that, uh, you know, that, that we have this ego that thinks that, that that we're the one creating. And he said the magic happens when you realize that it's already there. You just got to wake up and bring it into existence. So it's funny how you and Stephen Pressfield talking off the same, same song sheet. Yeah. I, Cause I believe, I believe that is so true. And I love that. I haven't read it, but I will go and get it today. Oh, you'll <laughs> like, love it. This person is speaking my language. Oh, he, he, he completely is. Yeah. And, 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 you know, so many of us procrastinate and he just breaks through that, uh, mm -hmm. that procrastination. Let's, mm -hmm. let's talk about, about really a symbol for you to make sure that you were successful because that day, that first week, you also put out a sign. And I think that, 
I felt like that sign, even though it was for your neighborhood, it was really more for you. Like every time you passed it, it was this mm -hmm. reminder. Tell me about the sign. Yeah, I put out the sign as soon as I made that six hundred dollars that bakery coming soon. I had my neighbor, one of my other neighbors had a printing company and he gave it to me for free because he was so he excited really? about it. Listen, Germantown, Nashville was excited about the cupcake collection. So when I started this business, I didn't know how to bake, not even out of a box, but I practiced on them. So as I was learning recipes and trying things, I would go knock on their doors and say, hey, it's me again. <laughs> My family says this is good. Will you try this? And they were like, heck yeah, bring it on. And so I, I would feed them things and they wanted the world to experience it. So this neighbor ends up making me a sign to put on my porch. It's a little like three by three sign. It is not big at all. But it says bakery coming soon and it was mine and bakery did not come soon. <laughs> it took me two years of working every day like it was a job before the story forever even opened. You talk about about your neighbors. Uh, I read somewhere that your neighbors called uh, your house the lemon crack house. Is that <laughs> yes. true? Yes, they called my house the lemon crack house because the first cupcake that I perfected was a lemon one dipped in glaze which is what i was gonna oh. um I'm, I'm probably gonna talk to you about that later on mm -hmm. but um they and my house before i moved in had been a crack house in the neighborhood as a matter of oh. fact as we were cleaning up the house my baby brought me something he said mommy i brought you something and it was a broken crack pipe oh man yeah. holy cow yeah when you have a wonderful chapter about your experience working in corporate America, because as your earlier businesses weren't working out, you went and applied for other jobs. Yes. You, you tried to get a job with FedEx. And by the way, talk about also, <laughs> also, you think you might have the job and your phone gets disconnected, so you can't take it. But yeah. that leads to that leads to this opportunity with AT&T. Mm -hmm. What did you what did you learn through the AT&T experience and then later on the Home Depot experience as you worked in corporate America? Oh, yeah. So I learned. So I learned how good I was at sales. Um, I, I didn't think I was a good salesperson, but I always had balloons on my chair. So if a challenge was set up, I would always win that challenge. And I end up getting on the number one producing team in the building. But what I learned at AT&T was customer service. I learned the value of not leaving people waiting. And I think it even aggravates my children my that, that are on my team members today when I say things like, why are you sending an email? Pick up the phone, call people. Why are you waiting? Do it right now. And they're like, you know, everything doesn't have to be done right now. But they tested us to see if you could tell how long you left somebody waiting in silence. So they have you close your eyes and just sit there. And when you felt like, you know, a minute had passed, raise your hand. And some of us were opening our eyes 10 seconds in. Really? <laughs> that soon? Really, you really don't realize how long you're leaving people waiting. So I learned customer service, you know, working at, um, at AT&T and that I was a really good salesperson at um, Home Depot, I learned how to put a product together. So I became uh, the on-staff writer and I ghost, I did all the ghost writing for the founders and I, I created a paper um, that was internally um, distributed. So I became the leader, of, the head reporter for all the in-store reporters. So I learned how to market. I learned how to um, write commercially. Uh, I had a degree in this, but you know, you have to actually have experience. So yeah. in the beginning stages of my business, it was me who was writing all the publicity, who was make, who was taking the pictures of all the product and posting those on the website because every stupid thing you've ever had to do is taking you from where you are to where you want to be. Do you recommend going through the, the, the corporate America route before somebody tries to go off on their own? 
I, I think a lot of people will end up in corporate America somewhere. I don't think that there's anything wrong per se with corporate America. And let me tell you why. My mother is an amazing administrator. She's 75 years old. I was laughing because she said, you know, Manana, I learned something today. She's like, I'm still learning every day. But my cousin called her on the phone and said, auntie, I'm ready to start my business. I need you to do this or that. And my mother's never owned a business in her life. But she has opened up enough businesses for her children and ran other people's businesses that she knows really everything it takes to open up a business correctly and how to run it properly. And so I don't think I think you still um, sort of execute entrepreneurial spirit, even if you're working yeah. at a corporate job. I believe just your client is that one customer whatever company that you're working for. So I believe everybody is an entrepreneur. It's just that those people are in the business of their own labor. And then you also got your degree at that time. Do you recommend the college path? Yeah, I don't necessarily believe that's the way you also have to go either. Because again, once you get your degree, you've got to go to, you know, I, what I call the school of hard knocks right, in right. order to apply the science that you learn. Yeah. So I, I don't think that everybody has to also go to school because I believe I got. Yes, I got my bachelor's degree from an accredited university, but I got my master's from the School of Hard Knocks. You sure did. And and by the way, speaking of your mom, just a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, 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 chapter plus on on <laughs> on, on your mom and on Thank the wealth you. that she brought to your family, like mm -hmm. struggling with money, but still rich in so many different ways and all the so stuff she ways. taught you. There's yeah. so many, so many lessons there. Mm -hmm. What would you say? What would you say um, with with the cupcake collection? has been the biggest aha you've had about business and good business and serving people? Mm, I think the, the biggest aha moment I've had with the Cupcake Collection is all you have is all you need to get you from where you are to where you want to be. I was waiting in those two years to get enough equipment, to have enough money, to find the right storefront and all of those things to open up my business when all along everything was already available inside of my house. I opened that store with a dorm size refrigerator and a KitchenAid mixer because that's what I had and that's what could pass the, the health inspection. All along, I thought I needed to have a commercial size refrigerator. I needed all these cut these commercial mixers. Yes, I was going to need those things one day, but I didn't need them on day one. We always let that get in our way. I think about young podcasters that I've mentored and they're like, so what microphone you use? I'm like, it's not about the microphone. Yeah. So, but but I will say this though, Mignon, <laughs> KitchenAid mixers. Those things, those are going to be around like, you know, I'm, you know, the next will be long gone. They'll be talking about it's like they're dinosaurs, you know, <laughs> and uh, and about how when humans were around and they'll be like, but they had these, those KitchenAid mixers, <laughs> those last forever. Yes. I was so excited when I was able to first buy my first KitchenAid mixer because I was mixing by hand, like just like with a handheld yeah. mixer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But even now, my handheld mixers are KitchenAid. Well, and KitchenAid, if you want to sponsor the show or, <laughs> right. or, or sponsor, Mignot, just give us a call because we're, we're clearly fans. We of the would product. love that. <laughs> I know it is. It is Memorial Day week here. Yes. And a lot of people are taking the family out to the park. They're getting together with loved ones. Nothing better to bring them than cupcakes. So we yes. will have a link, by the way, if people want to order from the cupcake collection and, and talk about this interview and talk about your book with family. But if they can't or if they want to give. Give cupcakes a try, Mignon. Mm -hmm. Can you give our stackers a little help with maybe maybe making it taste better? Yes. So if you're going to be taking cupcakes out to the picnic, right, or to, to the cookout, um, sometimes, like especially during this holiday week, it begins to get hot outside for the yes. very first time. So I would say take yourself a cooler with you, but don't pack it down with ice. Take yourself a cooler and get yourselves one of those pre packed ice packs that sort of screw into the lid yeah, and yeah, only yeah. put one of those inside so that the cooler is cool so that your product doesn't melt. That's one way that I was 
want to say to have a good cupcake experience because when you've slaved in the kitchen over your cupcakes and making them, you definitely don't want them to melt in the sun. And then another thing that I would say is make them melt proof. One of the things you can do instead of trying to put a traditional icing on the top of your cupcake, dip them in a um, a confectioner sugar and sort of water mixture and cover the whole cupcake in it. It's going to seal the cupcake, but also give you something that's not going to melt and give you just enough sweetness to add to your cupcake. And then the last thing that I would say that would make, well, it won't be the last thing. The third thing I would say that can make your cupcakes better is when you go out and get a box mix, try the mix-ins that they suggest. One of the best oh. things that I've done is to add an extra egg besides the one that they call for. Or if I'm trying to save some calories, I would exchange the oil for applesauce. That's one way that you can um, that you can exchange some of the fat out of a cake and still make it super moist. But the final thing that I would say that can make your cupcakes better is to visit the cupcakecollection.com <laughs> and let us is. just ship them to you. <laughs> that is, just press the easy button, stackers. Just press the easy button. You know, we'll have a link to that and we'll, and we'll have a link to the book in our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. Mignon, have a great Memorial Day. Thank you so much for for sharing your story. It's a great, it's, it's such a great story. And I know you helped a lot of people today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I hope that they will visit amazon.com and pick up my new book. It's called made from scratch, finding success without a recipe, or then come on over to Instagram at mignon.francois and tell me what they thought about it.